So the theme for my tutorial is challenging security assumptions. Um, I think uh, security is interesting to me largely because it's an empirical kind of science. If you think about the difference between security and crypto, um, crypto being largely a mathematical science is one where we can make assumptions, we can build proofs, we can build constructions based on those assumptions. In security, we're often forced to make assumptions because of limitations to our knowledge. But the ultimate source of truth in security is empirical reality. It's what can an attacker actually do with a, with a, uh, <clears throat> a system that's an artifact in front of us. Um, in this tutorial, I'm going to think about how assumptions work in security. And we're going to see through several different kinds of work um, the effects of um, uh, assumptions that are wrong, the effect of correcting assumptions on uh, the, the course of research and the kinds of systems we can build, um, and uh, a little bit about uh, perhaps what, uh, what we should be looking forward to in building new work, what kinds of assumptions are likely to be weak or likely to be strong. Um, the tutorial is going to be in three parts. The first part is going to be assumptions that have um, more to do with cryptography. This is going to be not a crypto talk. I am absolutely not a cryptographer. Uh, many of my friends are cryptographers, but I am not. I'm uh, a systems person. Um, so when I'm talking about cryptographic assumptions, the assumptions I'm going to be talking about are um, largely going to be ones that underlie uh, applied systems that use cryptography. In this part of the tutorial, I'm going to tell you about the cold boot attack for those people who don't know about it. You're going to get to hear some of the stories behind the discovery and development of the attack. Uh, we're going to try to make it lots of fun. Uh, I'm also going to talk about um, next generation censorship resistant technologies and the assumptions underlying those. Um, and uh, you're going to, uh, to get to hear why my personal homepage is blocked in China. Um, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to turn to engineering assumptions, another kind of assumption that uh, underlies secure systems. So these are assumptions largely about what we are able to build in practice. So it's one thing to say, if we build a system that, uh, that works this way, everything will be fine. It's quite another to go and find programmers and engineers to create it. And the medium for this talk is going to be electronic voting technologies. Um, you're going to hear, again, I hope, um, a lot of interesting stories, including why um, my passport is blocked in India. <laughs> And in the third part of the talk this afternoon, I'm, I'm going to switch gears and uh, talk about assumptions um, about uh, the, the visibility of things on the internet, assumptions um, surrounding measurement and what we are able to, um, to observe. Um, this talk is going to be um, largely aimed at, at researchers and people who want to study what's actually going on with protocols, with, uh, with systems on the internet. Um, uh, in this talk, um, uh, you're going to hear why my IP address is blocked in uh, approximately 1% uh, of the internet. All right. Um, so without further ado, um, bear with me while I switch decks here. Part one. <clears throat> And for the record, um, uh, the first part of this talk is going to be based on joint work with, uh, with many, many people. I'll mention specifically Nadia Henninger, who's in the room today. Um, and this is based on uh, our, our paper at USENIC Security 2008. Um, so to illustrate, to begin illustrating um, a little bit about uh, um, uh, assumptions in cryptography and how um, uh, a certain kind of misassumption about, about the way the world works, that is assumptions about the way um, computer systems in practice behave can undermine perfectly good cryptography. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you about the cold boot attack. So let's start with a practical problem, which is theft of data from mobile devices. Um, this could be your laptop, this could be your Android phone, um, increasingly, we're carrying around um, 
uh, a large fraction of, of our data, or at least the credentials that are used to access it. And if those um, devices on which it's uh, carrying are stolen, that can be a huge problem for us. So what happens when um, an attacker steals your laptop, steals your mobile phone? Is he going to immediately get access to all of your information? Hopefully not. If you've taken some very basic kinds of protections, um, <clears throat> the most basic kind of um, protection you might take is having some kind of password, some kind of lock screen, something in the operating system that will authenticate you and just keep your device from giving the attacker all your data on command. One limitation of this, though, is um, uh, and most easily seen in the case of physical laptops, although this applies to mobile devices too, um, the attacker can circumvent that kind of protection just by, say, taking your hard disk out, putting it in his own computer, and uh, uh, rebooting and accessing your files. Very, very simple basic attack that people have been doing in practice forever. So um, there it goes. Now the attacker's happy. So um, in response to this, of course, best practices in security have called for doing more than just having a lock screen. Um, uh, um, the best practice for, for several years now has been to use some kind of disk encryption on your system. And this is, in many jurisdictions, this is something that the law creates incentives for companies and users to do, in that if your data is encrypted and the laptop is lost or stolen, you don't have to tell your users because it's presumably protected. Um, so industry best practice calls for not only this kind of authentication, but also full disk encryption, which is going to make sure that uh, the data on the disk can't be accessed without some secret key. But what happens, what really happens? How safe is that data actually in practice? Um, so every year, hundreds of thousands of laptops are stolen. Many more cell phones are stolen. We know that iPhone theft is one of the leading sources for the rise in crime in places like New York City. It's the high order bit of uh, trends in crime. So these devices that are stolen, if they were encrypted, were they really protected? Well, in order to understand, we, let's start by just reviewing for the less technical, um, the people in the audience who aren't applied cryptographers, uh, what, what we mean by disk encryption. Um, so, um, uh, normally when you, you have a computing device, your operating system um, maintains a file system that's storing data on some physical medium. Um, full disk encryption of the type I'm talking about is going to add a layer of crypto that sits below the file system and on top of the, uh, the physical storage device. And this encryption is going to work on the fly. Every time the disk is going to um, write out a block of data, it's going to encrypt it. Every time uh, data is read back, it's going to be decrypted. Now, of course, this has to be keyed by something. And the way disk encryption typically works is there's some kind of key that is uh, either generated from the user's password or encrypted somewhere else based on the user's password. Um, the user will put in a password when they turn on their computer that will allow the operating system to read the file system and, uh, and proceed to boot. Now, because the operating system is running from this disk, if it's, if it's a classic full disk encryption scheme, the operating system has to maintain in memory somewhere this key so that it can continue to access files. And that's going to be the case as long as the OS is running with uh, a classic full disk encryption scheme. So let's see how this changes our attack scenarios. So um, we're going to assume furthermore that the computer is locked, of course, so the attacker can't uh, just uh, uh, access the files directly. Um, what could he try to do? Well, um, there are a couple things. He could try to, um, uh, he could try to, uh, 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 sorry, I want to go to the next slide for this. There are a couple things he could do. Um, he could try to, uh, uh, say, get the key out of RAM by, uh, by some other method. He could try to, um, uh, uh, say, 
um, take out the hard disk. He can't do that because the, uh, the disk is encrypted. He could try to get the OS to give him the key. That's not going to work because it's locked. Um, he might try to circumvent the operating system um, and uh, get the key uh, uh, out of memory, say, by rebooting into his own OS. But, and here's where the assumptions underlying classic disk encryption come in, um, uh, the only way he can get rid of the operating system is by rebooting the computer. And if he does that, the, uh, either the OS, the BIOS, uh, or just memory being erased by depowering the machine is going to cause the key to be lost. Right? <laughs> All right. So um, this is where we start running into problems. So um, how many people in this room are cryptographers? All right. Um, how many people who are cryptographers um, have ever, say, read a paper that talks about transistors in DRAM? Okay, all right, uh, gold star to those of you who span both of those, uh, both of those areas. There are too few people um, who have knowledge that, that's that broad. So let me give you, for everyone, just the very, very basic view of what's going on in, in, uh, in memory, in your computer's main memory, your DRAM. And this is going to be way oversimplified for people who are computer architecture people, but it's good enough for our purposes. So we can think about each bit in, um, in DRAM, in your, you know, your, your 10 gigabytes of, uh, of main memory, um, as a capacitor, basically a jar that is storing some charge. And when we want to write a 1 into one of those cells, we just um, uh, apply uh, some voltage. It uh, charges up. The jar is full of charge. Now we're storing a 1. Um, but these are real physical devices, and so they're not uh, perfectly insulated. And over time, charge is going to leak out of that jar. Um, if we wait too long, that one is going to, that charge is all going to drain out, and the one will flip to a zero. So periodically, um, we have to refresh. This is what makes dynamic RAM dynamic. Um, we have to refresh. We have to see, is the jar half empty? Well, then we'll top it off. And in real systems, this is happening every tens of milliseconds, something like that, for every cell in memory. Um, if we don't do that, as I just said, the charge is going to leak out and we're going to lose information. The, the cell is going to decay. Um, so based on this model of behavior, people who design disk encryption systems made two security assumptions. So these seem, you know, they don't seem all that unreasonable. First, the data is going to fade out almost instantaneously, you know, on the order of magnitude of the refresh time, if we stop refreshing dynamic RAM. So um, if the attacker unplugs the computer to try to blow away the operating system and reboot it, get his own software in place to try to, to sniff out the contents of your disk, um, the memory is going to be erased. If he shuts down the computer, the operating system has a chance to erase critical parts of memory on its way out. Um, and this assumption makes sense. This is what I assume. This is what most people assume, because most of us have had the experience of, for one reason or another, our machine lost power, and suddenly that paper we were writing isn't there anymore. Um, uh, so it's an intuitive assumption. If you're more paranoid, maybe you assume that there is something left, but that you're going to need like a clean room or something to go and read it out of memory, that this is going to be a very difficult thing to do. It's going to take special equipment. It's like the, the Peter Goodman, um, Goodman hard disk uh, data recovery attacks from the 90s. Um, so these were the two widespread assumptions. They, they're both wrong. All right, so here's what really happens. And um, this is a um, uh, direct result of experiment. Every uh, bit you're about to see here is experimentally recorded. There is no simulation. So we did an experiment to actually test these assumptions. The, the experiment works like this. We're going to take a normal desktop PC, um, hook it up to a device that can cycle the power, basically disconnect it from, uh, from AC, and leave it off for different numbers of seconds. Um, before we turn it off, we're going to pick a location in RAM 
and put some bits there. The bits that we're going to use are a one bit version of this image here. So one bit in this image corresponds to one cell in physical memory. And then we're going to boot the computer back up, just load a very small bootloader that will read out the same portion of RAM without letting the OS or the BIOS um, uh, get in the way and interfere with what's there. So we're going to see exactly what changes when the power is off. Um, here's what we find. After five seconds without any power to the computer, there's no change whatsoever. After 30 seconds, we can see some information is starting to be lost. After a minute, there's still substantial information. And after five minutes, and it's a little bit difficult to see on the projector, but even after five minutes, you can still see the outline of her hair. There's still something there. This is the phenomenon of um, DRAM remnants. Let me give you, since we have um, um, a longer period today, I want to give you another view of this, which is um, a video. And in this video version, um, you're going to see over a few minutes, um, one frame per second. So this is what it looks like. <laughs> it's fading out. Careful. <laughs> All right, she's mostly gone now. Um, there are a bunch of remarkable things happening here. Um, one thing you'll notice is these, uh, these horizontal lines. I mean, that's the most prominent feature, right? They're, they're, it's, it's fading not to black, but to these bars. And one way to think about why that is is that different um, cells in memory, different regions of cells um, in this particular DRAM device um, were physically wired so that absence of charge represented a one or absence of charge represented a zero. And there are different regions of the memory for whatever reason of layout or electrical properties uh, the chip designers decided to assign to th those different categories. Um, there are other things you can see here too. Um, so as we watch this decay, you'll see um, uh, vertical regions, right? There are very prominent differences and almost gradients here that are happening again and again. That's actually, we're seeing physical variation across the surface of the chip. That some areas of the chip are either at a slightly different temperature or slightly better or worse insulated, still within the tolerances of manufacturing. Um, but that little bit of change is going to be vis visible to the computer in this, this kind of uh, very peculiar introspective process we're doing here. The third thing I want you to notice, which really you can see in the video better than anything else, is the stability from frame to frame. So we don't actually have a camera pointed at the physical device here. Each frame of this represents another run of the experiment where we've held the machine off for um, maybe last time we held it off for 40 seconds. Now we're going to hold it off for 41 seconds. Um, and yet, basically the same cells have decayed uh, as in the previous frame plus a few more. So what we're seeing here is a kind of predictability, of stability. If the system is in roughly the same physical uh, shape with the same device, um, uh, the same cells are going to decay after the same period of time in every experiment. With just a little bit of, uh, uh, so it, it looks like it's a video camera pointed into the chip almost. And that's going to be very useful for a potential attacker. So this is DRAM remnants. This is your, your one chance to see inside um, uh, uh, a DRAM circuit without power. So right, based on those observations, we see that first, this assumption is uh, probably not going to halt. Uh, if we can still get some information out after five minutes. Question in the back? Yes, so the same, the same features hold across different locations. There are variations from um, model of DRAM to model of DRAM in terms of um, what the pattern is like exactly, um, the amount of time it's going to take, 
um, DRAM that's on newer processes and more dense and thus having smaller cells tends to decay a bit, uh, a bit faster than older DRAM that has larger cells. Um, but this is generally a property of how the, uh, um, how, how the physics works. Um, so this assumption is not true, um, that uh, data is going to decay instantaneously. Instead, we can characterize the delay as gradual is predominantly unidirectional to some ground state, that is to whatever state is represented by the absence of charge, and is predictable. This is something that we can gain insight into by experiment and use that insight um, to try to determine which bits were more likely to have decayed at a given time. Question? Um, yeah. the area What's that? Yeah. There are some bits that are going to decay more quickly than others, in fact, yeah. So can we direct the memory to store sensitive information on these bits? Well, so that may or may not give you an advantage depending on whether, A, it's fast enough, B, whether you can find those bits, and, yeah, right. So, um, uh, uh, yes, in principle, you could try to do that. You'd have to do experiments on every individual uh, uh, in, on every manifestation of a computing device in order to figure out which bits those were. But if you, if you were to do experiments like this, you could determine that and use those bits. And there's actually been subsequent work that's looked at questions like that. Um, and, you know, that's, um, for some things like embedded systems, um, that, that could be really useful. Um, but still, you have to ask whether, you know, even the quickest bits to decay are going to be quick enough. Another concern I'd have about that, actually, that I haven't seen well addressed in, in work on the subject, is whether those bits are also, for, for other reasons, the least reliable in the circuit and the most likely to have just naturally occurring errors. Um, so maybe if something's really important, uh, uh, you don't want to store it there. All right, so there was a second assumption I mentioned, which is the difficulty, yes, question. Of course. Okay. Uh, you say it's unidirectional. Have you actually tried to put charge uh, in the to, say, after 30 seconds or 60 and, and uh, check if it can recover the unit? After 30 seconds or 60? So, what you're seeing here, um, this is actually after the computer has started up again. So, as soon as we power the computer again, the DRAM controller starts refreshing every cell and fixes each cell into its instantaneous value. So that's actually happened in every cell in every of the, one of these images. It's, this is what the computer saw when it tried to refresh again. Now you might try um, something fancier than that. You might try, uh, uh, I don't know, if you did have special equipment, maybe using something to measure, the, 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 uh, measure every cell in a more detailed way and see if you can extract even more information, something like that. It might be interesting to try. Oh, yes, question. What device have you used to, to measure this? A computer. <laughs> Sorry, what's that? So um, <laughs> this, is, this is with a desktop computer measuring it. So is this is the same, the same? The same computer, the computer that the DRAM is in. So this is one of the, the things I really love about... Uh, How can you do that? What's that? How can you do that? Um, so um, uh, we turn the computer on after unplugging it for a while and read what's in the same memory. We also used a thermometer, but I'll get to that in, in, in a few minutes. Um, this is one of, one of the things I really love about uh, doing um, uh, work at this place in the, in the software stack. You can see low-level behavior of the computer by, um, uh, uh, by, by, by looking um, uh, very close to the hardware. Um, the, uh, 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 there's this, um, this sense in which a lot of what we do in computer science is about trying to hide the messy behavior of physical systems. Um, but occasionally, if you, um, say, look hard enough or do things that are insane enough, um, you, can, you can start to see some of it again. And that actually has pretty interesting implications for random number generation, too, where 
most of, uh, say, electrical engineering is about taking things that are really noisy analog systems and making them look like beautiful digital abstractions. And oh, suddenly we can't get any entropy anymore. It's, it's, it's a, a little bit ironic. Um, so people have actually proposed using this kind of phenomenon, too, as uh, a, a source of entropy for various uh, applications. All right, so um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more. Maybe I can answer your question um, uh, a, a little bit more deeply um, by talking about uh, why the second assumption um, underlying full disk encryption systems was wrong. This is the assumption that the data is difficult to recover. Um, so now that we know that data stays around in DRAM, well, let me give the people who are just coming in a second to, to settle. <clears throat> yes? Uh, um, the computer looks at, um, one, when you boot it up, uh -huh. it looks at uh, one bit of RAM, uh -huh. and checks how many percent of it is the uh, one side, well, and, and decides, I, I guess it needs a certain threshold. Yeah. So could you control the threshold? Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. If, um, so the... Um, uh, the threshold is probably, and I'm, I'm not, a, um, I, I, I'm not a, a chip designer, but I assume that the threshold is pretty low because we're able to drain these, um, uh, these, these capacitors really well just by, um, uh, 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 if, we, if we want to uh, make sure there's no charge there. Um, you probably could adjust it. Um, maybe in the DRAM controller somehow, but I, I don't know if you can do that, uh, if there's any way to do that in the field. That may be something that's internal to the DRAM controller and that uh, 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 you'd need to have, um, you'd need to go back to the fab to change. I don't, I don't know for sure. Yes? Back to that question about the device. So you have to write a program that reads the RAM, the DRAM, right? Yeah. And you have to have it running on that computer after turning it on. Yeah, yeah. Is it possible to do it on a, on a computer that you found on the street? Um, let, me, let me get to that um, in this slide. All right. So it's, in fact, not difficult to recover on arbitrary computers um, the, uh, the data that was in RAM, if there's anything that's still uh, surviving because of this remnants phenomenon. In fact, you don't need any special equipment. Um, you just need software that's going to be able to run before the operating system um, has uh, loaded stuff on top of whatever data you wanted. So typically, when the BIOS starts, um, what, uh, the, the DRAM controller will start refreshing. Whatever state memory was in is going to be frozen in time. Uh, and unless software starts overwriting portions of it, that data is going to be recoverable just by normal read operations uh, to different locations in DRAM. So we have to try to make software that's going to, without a bias in place, uh, I'm sorry, without an operating system in place, read this stuff back. And uh, um, uh, we were able to implement and demonstrate several versions of this that have very, very tiny footprints. Um, so uh, two versions that use network boot, either by, via Pixie or via um, uh, uh, an EFI network boot version. Also one version that just boots from a USB stick. So you plug in, I'll give you some examples of this, plug in, say, um, a portable hard drive or a USB stick or a network cable, um, that's going to deliver your few kilobytes of software um, that uh, actually reads memory and is going to take out the data um, that's being read from RAM. Your thing boots, reads every location in RAM, and sends an image of whatever the current state is to the attacker. We even implemented a version that will sit on an, an iPod or uh, an iPhone and uh, uh, allow you to, to boot from that kind of device. So the attacker can simulate, uh, can, can conceal um, this attack uh, uh, with a, a typical portable device. Does that start answering your question? So it does work against, uh, against arbitrary devices. You don't have to characterize the device first. There are some caveats to that that I'm going to mention in later slides. So this makes uh, for the basis of um, the cold boot attack. We can put these pieces back together again and see how they change the story for disk encryption. 
So um, the attacker in our scenario is going to come up to your laptop. Maybe he's just stolen it from you at the, at the coffee shop. Luckily, you left it in uh, a locked state. He doesn't have your password. Um, maybe, maybe it wasn't powered on. It was closed, and so it went to sleep. In that case, he just opens it up, and it wakes back up again, so that doesn't add any more protection. Um, your disk is fully encrypted, but the key is in RAM. So the attacker is unhappy, but oh, he has an idea. He's going to try the cold boot attack. He's going to take that USB stick that has some memory dumping software on it, plug it in, pull out the battery, put it in again really quickly. The computer is going to dump the contents of RAM to the USB stick. Now he's going to examine that RAM, pull out the encryption key for the hard disk, pull out the hard disk and decrypt it on his own. He's won. But, okay, there's some simple things that can go wrong here. One thing is the um, user could just set, uh, say, um, set a password in the BIOS so that the attacker can't boot the machine. Maybe the BIOS is set to do a full memory test, which is going to overwrite a large part of RAM before software can take over. Maybe the user is, uh, the, this particular machine has ECC memory. With ECC memory, you have to initialize it to a known state. Otherwise, every time you uh, read um, uh, a page de novo, um, it's going to likely cause an ECC fault because there'll be some errors from when the system uh, was off. Um, so in any of these cases, this very basic scenario I'm going to outline is going to fail because the attacker's software isn't going to get to run on the machine um, uh, uh, before the, uh, the memory has been cleared. So what do we do? Well, um, oh, he's unhappy. Well, we can come up with a more advanced version of the attack. And this parallels that initial hard disk attack that I, I told you about in, in, in the very beginning. So what if the attacker, instead of putting the memory stick into his own computer to read, uh, the uh, USB stick into the, the victim's computer to run his software, just pulls the memory chip out of the machine and puts it into his, which is configured not to clear RAM on start. All right, now he can dump it and be happy. All right, but does the, doesn't this sound crazy? We're going to actually take the memory chip out of the computer? Isn't that going to take longer than the attacker has unless he's really, really quick? Aren't we going to get a bunch of errors in the time that's going to take? Um, um, and the answer is, yeah, if we're naive about it, probably this is going to be uh, a pretty poor attack. But we discovered in experiment that we can do a lot better if we just cool down the memory chips. So here's a simple technique the attacker can use to cool down the memory chips. You can take one of these cans of keyboard duster spray, uh, which says on the back, um, do not discharge in inverted position, hold upright. Okay, so you just ignore that, turn it upside down and spray it on the chip, and what you'll get out of that is not the, uh, the hydrocarbon gas you're expecting, but the liquid hydrocarbon propellant, which happens to be basically a refrigerant gas. So the change in pressure and then the subsequent evaporation is all going to cause a drop in temperature. And we've measured about uh, minus 50 Celsius uh, that we were able to get uh, with this very simple, very low cost technique. Um, if you cool memory to that temperature, you're going to have a lot less decay. Decay is going to slow down. Um, we measured in practice um, less than 0.2% decay after a minute, um, uh, and long remnants of even after a period, maybe 10 minutes, if you keep, uh, keep the, 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 the chip cool, you're likely to have little enough decay that in the area of the key, you're going to lose probably no bits. Um, this works. Uh, uh, here's a close up. Uh, some of that is frost, unfortunately. Uh, this was my laptop uh, that I eventually gave my, my job talks on when I was on the faculty market uh, some, some time later than this. Um, you might be wondering whether this destroys the machine. Um, I, can, I can vouch that it does not. I've uh, uh, repeated this experiment. Um, probably a hundred times on this one, uh, on, on, on this poor computer in practice, uh, in, in particular. Um, 
We did take some steps to try to maybe dry it off after the experiment because you're left with a lot of water that's, con uh, that's condensed, uh, so your motherboard is wet. Um, so we tried to clean, uh, clean it off with a, with a hair dryer or something just before repeating the experiment so, that, so the circuits wouldn't rust. Um, but modern computers, laptops are, are pretty well built. They're built for spilling coffee on them. Uh, this sort of thing uh, did, did not kill the computer. Um, uh, this holds true even if we take the chip out of the uh, computer. Here it is sitting on the table next to the computer. Um, we can leave it there 10 minutes, keep spraying keyboard duster on it. it the, the, most of the data is still going to be there after that, um, after that uh, time span. Um, we can do even better with, say, liquid nitrogen. Um, engineering schools are fantastic. Uh, people, people from the Technion here, you must know where around here to get liquid nitrogen, right? To make, to make ice cream or, uh, or attack laptops. Um, so uh, we did this experiment with liquid nitrogen and measured about the, the same decay we saw after a minute at negative 50 uh, degrees C uh, after an hour. And, uh, 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 so just sitting here in my Google thermos on the, on the lab bench, um, this is not necessary in practice, but it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, yes, you, you see we, we're, we're taking very careful safety precautions, such as labeling it liquid nitrogen, do not drink. <laughs> um, uh, the one the one uh, case in which we had a, we destroyed some hardware during these experiments actually involved um, the liquid nitrogen. Um, I tend to be uh, sort of an energetic person. I'm moving all around. My arms are all over the place when I'm excited about something and talking. I get, get very into it. And I was very excited about these experiments. And unfortunately, in one run of it, we put this, uh, I put this uh, uh, thermos with the, uh, the ram in it on the edge of the table like the coffee cup here. And here I am, very excited about it, waiting for the hour, walking around the room. I flip over, whoa, goes over onto the floor. Luckily, no one was burned, no one was injured by the liquid nitrogen. But the, um, the DRAM at uh, uh, almost 200 below hit the floor pretty hard. And uh, uh, it popped all of the integrated circuits off of the, uh, the PC board. Um, so we weren't able to recover the data in that case. Maybe if we soldered them back on, it would have still been there had we taken emergency precautions to protect our data. But uh, yeah, ho hopefully these days in grad school, people are more careful about experimental uh, safety. I advise everyone to, to do that. All right. So. Um, this gives the attacker one way of dealing with this problem. Oh, there's some questions. Yes. I will get to the TPM question. I'll get to the TPM question, and it's actually a very interesting question. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that in sequence. OK, so this gives the attacker one way of um, extracting data uh, and, and getting the key. He can move the, uh, the chips into his own computer, Cool them as necessary to reduce uh, the error to tolerable levels and read, read it back out. Um, but that's, you can imagine scenarios where that's not going to be possible. Maybe um, uh, despite the attacker's precautions, he's going to lose some bits. Uh, maybe uh, 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 memory um, uh, of the future decays more quickly because it's much more dense. Um, <clears throat> In these cases, there may still, despite the other precautions like cooling, be bit errors. How can we deal with bit errors in a cryptographic key in a cold boot attack-like scenario? Um, so let's say that um, uh, we've recovered some key K prime. It's a, the decayed version of a key K. Um, and we have uh, some fraction of the bits we know have decayed. Um, the naive method, just doing a brute force search over what the, the correct bits might be and trying to decrypt with every one of those, is going to become intolerable very quickly um, as the, the fraction of bits that have decayed increases. We can find an insight here, though, that's going to help us a lot. 
which is that in real systems that are using cryptography, um, especially while the key is in use, they're not going to just be storing some random key. They're going to be storing the scheduled form of that key. That is the, uh, uh, a series of subkeys derived from it in some algorithmic way. Uh, this is for implementational efficiency. They're not going to throw that away between, say, disk accesses. Um, and in fact, every program we looked at um, was keeping around the full key schedule uh, during the full operation uh, of, of the system. So the scheduled key for ciphers like AES contains redundant information. And we can treat that redundant information like an error correcting code and use it to recover from bit errors far more efficiently than the naive approach. So for the non-cryptographers in the audience, let me begin by illustrating how this works with DES, uh, the data encryption standard, which is now, of course, obsolete, um, but has a very simple key schedule for this purpose. In the DES key schedule, there are essentially about 14 redundant copies of each bit from the original key. And so we can just recover the full schedule from memory, line up those 14 copies of each bit, and say, take the majority for each bit. So if we pulled that top line out of memory, this is maybe 20% of bits have decayed, um, we can know with pretty high certainty um, that this bit was supposed to be a zero in the original key. AES has a more complicated key schedule, but it still ha works extremely well for our purposes. Um, you start out with your 128, say, bit key, um, and you're going to apply some algorithm uh, to create 10 more keys based on the uh, one for each subsequent round uh, of the block cipher. And uh, the way this works is basically um, uh, uh, the key scheduling algorithm operates on 32-bit words, and um, each word it's generating is going to be an XOR of two previous words or an XOR of a previous word with uh, 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 a, another previous word passed through a function called the key schedule core, which introduces some nonlinearity. So um, how can we correct bit errors um, in an AES key schedule? We can make the observation that um, uh, in uh, uh, that, um, uh, that four bytes from round n uh, uniquely determine three bytes in round n plus one. And we can find groups of these. We can actually find four groups of these that are different, different say, slices um, of, uh, of each pair of keys. And for each of those slices, we can enumerate um, uh, the possible values for those seven bytes. Those, those seven bytes are going to have two to the 32 possible values. We can eliminate many of them as unlikely based on our knowledge of the, uh, the way bits have decayed, what direction they're decaying in this area, and so forth. This excludes the vast majority. And then we can repeat this for each of the four slices. This is going to give us a, number, a large number of candidate keys, which we can rank based on the, uh, the probability that bit error has resulted in these, so sort of the most likely based on the amount of bit error first. And then we can test them by, um, based on this candidate key, let's expand that into a full key schedule uh, and just compare and measure the, the amount of error that we'd be observing if that were the real key. If we have the wrong key, uh, it's likely that the schedule is going to uh, be totally independent from what, uh, what we, uh, l largely independent from what we observe in memory. If we have the right key, we're going to expect it to line up very well. Now we um, implemented this for AES. We implemented um, uh, a version for RSA as well that Nadia Hanninger later improved substantially in, in subsequent work that she talked uh, uh, a little bit about RSA key recovery in the face of errors uh, in her tutorial on Sunday. Um, uh, uh, in RSA, it's interesting, the redundancy doesn't come from the fact that your key is scheduled, but uh, from the intrinsic properties of, uh, 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 of, uh, of, of the RSA algorithm. Or it can come from the, the system's reality, which is that you're storing not just, say, P and Q, 
but you're also storing D and E and uh, your, uh, your other, other values for the Chinese remainder theorem. Um, so in that case, as in the uh, block cipher schedule case, um, you have this trade-off between efficiency uh, in operation, the reason we want to store redundant information to make our runtime faster, versus security in the face of an attack like the cold boot attack. And it's really, really hard to convince implementers um, uh, uh, to give up that efficiency in exchange for security against an attack that most users will probably never face. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's the trade-off we find there. Um, we can apply a similar approach based on uh, redundancy in key schedules to find keys in memory. So um, you have many gigabytes of RAM, you're looking for a very tiny key, how do you efficiently locate it? And in previous work, people considered methods based on things like uh, looking for regions with high entropy, but of course, so much has high entropy these days because any encrypted data, lots of compressed data, is going to have similar properties. Um, or looking at uh, uh, trying to reverse engineer the data structures used by the operating system and follow pointers and so forth, but especially in the presence of errors, that's a really laborious, really bad strategy. Our method focuses instead on the key schedules once again, and um, so we can completely automatically um, find candidate keys using, um, using this algorithm. Basically what we're going to do is um, iterate through every, um, every byte in memory and assume for the sake of our test that this is the beginning of a key schedule. Um, under that assumption, we're going to basically uh, work through, um, through the schedule, assume that, uh, that this is right, try to perform, try to apply the, uh, uh, the constraints of a real schedule around that byte and find out what the difference is between uh, what that would look like and what we really see in memory. Um, through this method, um, we're able, we were, we're actually surprised by how many keys we found in RAM, not just the AES key we were expecting to see, but keys used by other applications and the operating system in other places. It turns out most implementations of AES use the same in-memory layout for their key schedule. So, uh, uh, that helps a lot in trying to, uh, uh, to apply a technique like this generally, but it's a simple and highly effective thing to do. All right, so to summarize the, uh, uh, the steps here, the attacker is going to extract the contents of memory, maybe using cooling to help him out, locate keys automatically using uh, 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 the properties of the combinatorial properties of the key schedule to, um, uh, to find them without any manual intervention. Uh, for each key he finds, he's going to apply another algorithm to automatically correct any bit errors, and then he's going to attempt to use each of those candidates to decrypt the hard drive. This doesn't sound very practical, does it? It's a lot of steps anyway. Well, we applied this and uh, actually used it to demonstrate attacks against every major disk encryption product on the market at the time. Um, in fact, for the case of Windows BitLocker, which was uh, uh, probably the most widely used, we made a fully automated version that does all of those steps, just a plug and play version. You plug the, as, as I was, was saying, a USB stick you can plug into the computer. We call it Bit Unlocker. And Ari Feldman, who is a, a really, really brilliant guy, who is now a postdoc at Penn, implemented this in about two days, starting from scratch with just the documentation to BitLocker. He had to implement his own version of BitLocker in order to get this to work. Um, really, truly impressive. Um, okay, so here you can see it running. There's video of this uh, uh, somewhere on the web. Um, and then uh, the USB stick actually boots you into a Linux OS uh, that uh, lets you browse through the files on the encrypted drive. Um, so there you can, you can access the uh, P equals NP proof that was on the, the encrypted partition. 
Okay, so um, let me talk briefly about countermeasures. And there's a lot that can be said about, about countermeasures to this. Um, the reality is that there's only really one countermeasure that anyone is using in practice these days. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I'm not sure if that's mentioned in the slides here, but that countermeasure is um, basically to have a password that occurs before your operating system boots, which is the way to you generate your key. Um, and to shut down your computer um, when it's not uh, in use, like when you're going through customs. Um, uh, but we can think, for uh, academic purposes, we can think about a lot of other different countermeasures um, uh, that you could do. Say, encrypting the full contents of memory during, uh, during sleep or during hibernation. Um, this kind of thing is time consuming, of course. Um, and it requires the user to enter their password before the computer can start doing useful work again. You notice that every operating system we actually use um, for reasons of usability and efficiency starts working immediately when you open the lid again, even while it's waiting for you to enter your password. Um, this keeps it from being slow for the next uh, few seconds after you enter your password because it's doing things like uh, deferred timers and so forth that, uh, uh, that otherwise would uh, uh, would cause it to be even more laggy than it really is. Um, this is, um, sounds simple, turns out to be, for, for most real operating systems, turns out to be something that people aren't willing to do. Um, another thing you could do is avoid pre-computation in, in things like key schedules. This hurts performance um, and uh, 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 probably isn't going to give you any guarantees anyway, because even if you didn't have the key, uh, the, the scheduled form of the key, the attacker could do more aggressive cooling, the attacker could do a, uh, a bigger brute force search to find the, uh, where in memory the key was. It's not intractable to try decrypting with every memory position. It just takes a while. Um, so that's a, a roadblock, but it hurts every real user all the time. Um, you could try fully encrypted memory. Um, this is something that a lot of people have um, looked at doing in, uh, uh, in hardware. And maybe someday we're going to have this. Um, but for now, memory is one of the major bottlenecks in the performance of your computer. It's not a place where the hardware community has much appetite for slowing down, at least, at least for slowing down everything. Um, uh, Another thing, and you, you were asking about, sir, earlier in the talk, was uh, what, what about a trusted platform module? Um, and when we were doing this work, I was really curious about that, too. Is the TPM potentially going to help? Um, fascinatingly, in the Windows implementation, anyway, the TPM has the opposite effect. And BitLocker, is, in its default configuration, was, of, of all the things we tested, by far the most dangerous. Um, if you're using BitLocker and a TPM, I can compromise your disk even if you turn your computer off all the way and you don't have, you, you, the password is not in memory. And the reason for this is the way BitLocker uses the TPM is um, it stores the encryption key in the TPM so that only the real Windows kernel can read it. And when you turn your computer on again, the kernel accesses the TPM, recovers the key, and uh, uh, mounts the hard drive and boots all the way up to your login prompt. So there, the operating system login prompt is the thing that's keeping the, user, the attacker from getting at the disk. It's just like in the scenario where your computer was asleep. Basically, all the attacker needs to do is turn on your computer and that key will be back in RAM thanks to the TPM, so even if you shut it down completely. So this is a big problem for, for real-world security. This is, um, uh, uh, there's basically no state the computer can be in if you're using um, BitLocker in its default TPM mode um, in which the attacker doesn't have a path that leads to, uh, to stealing your, your disk encryption key. Question? No? All right, so... Um, I want to talk about one more thing in this, in this lecture. Um, so let me get through a few last points about, um, uh, 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 about uh, the cold boot attack before switching to the other topic. Um, so these, these are, this is the summary. You just heard all of these things. I don't have to, to belabor them. Um, 
But there's some broader lessons here and some broader things we can take away from this about um, uh, assumptions as they apply to cryptography in practice. Um, so mistaken assumptions can undermine the security of an applied crypto system that otherwise would be perfectly good. Um, the people who built these disk encryption systems, many of them are serious researchers, former researchers and engineers who knew what they were doing. They thought hard about these problems, um, but they had a blind spot here. Um, a large part of why that blind spot occurred, in my opinion, has to do with this, um, this problem of abstractions that we have in computer science. So we love making abstractions. We love organizing the world around black boxes with known interfaces. But often, that can hide really, really critical properties for security. So let, let, me, let me make this a little bit more real for you. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the people who implemented disk encryption software really, really didn't know this happened, even though they were smart. I had the, uh, the privilege of personally disclosing these attacks to the CTO of one big company who uh, had been the guy who actually designed the, the disk encryption product, their, one of their central products. And he turned white as a ghost. Uh, he just couldn't believe that this was true. He thought uh, uh, it, it undermined a big part of his worldview. On the other hand, a couple of years later, I was at, at, a, at a party and ran into a gentleman who um, uh, was the retired CTO of a semiconductor firm and held some of the first patents on dynamic RAM. And I told him about the cold boot attack. He laughed at me. He said, well, of, of course this is how DRAM behaves. No one ever told us you wanted the information to go away when the power goes out. <laughs> so there's really, because of this divide between hardware people, software people, in particular in this case, uh, these black boxes, the, the requirements and behaviors were not communicated. No one told the hardware people we were relying on this happening. No one told the software people that such a thing was possible. So I think this is a problem when, when the normal interface does not include properties we're relying on for security, things that are hidden assumptions, maybe things that are stated assumptions but are never communicated to the other community. This is a recipe for security disaster because the attacker does not care about the petty differences between sub-communities in our field. The attacker is going to be able to bridge those abstractions. All right, I want to move on to um, the second topic I wanted to talk about in the first part of the tutorial, which is another example of, um, of uh, crypt, yes. What made you think about uh, uh, starting this uh, experiment? Ah, so that's interesting. So we, um, uh, the collaborative process behind the cold boot attack, you notice that the long list of authors, there are nine authors on that paper, um, uh, was a long and complicated one. It started out with, uh, I guess, with Seth, Seth Schoen at EFF and Jake Applebaum, who was working with him, um, who had, I, I believe they had been at a hacker conference where um, someone looking at a different problem um, had noticed had observed stuff left over in memory images from, from long before um, and uh, speculated that maybe some of it had survived, uh, survived reboots, but outside the context of, um, of, of things like key recovery entirely, but speculated that there might be some phenomenon going on there. Um, they decided uh, that they, they were interested in looking at this more, talked to Ed Felton at Princeton, who brought the rest of us um, into the group, and we sort of made it from that observation into, um, into the empirical science. So um, started from the hacking community. That's another abstraction, really, or at least a gap between communities. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the sort of non-professional hacker side versus the academic research side, where more cross-pollination would be really for, uh, potentially fertile. Yes? You know what happened with uh, all this, this, this encryption products since the attack in 2009? Some of them have disclaimers now. 
<laughs> um, uh, there are, so I'm, I'm trying to think. I think Linux has um, improved support for things like pre-boot authentication, um, where you enter a password before the, the OS turns on and where it no longer supports hibernation, which is a, a partial defense. But you have to turn your computer off. Um, uh, Microsoft has done disappointingly little to make that easy to set up. It's very hard to use BitLocker in TPM mode with a pre-boot password. Uh, um, I do it every time I have to set this up. I have to go and read a manual and do complicated things at the command line that make me afraid I'm going to lose my whole hard disk in the process. Uh, that would be a step in the right direction. On the research side, of course, there's been much more. There's been all this thinking about leakage-resilient uh, crypto, about uh, new stuff now about oblivious RAM that's really exciting. Uh, there have been proposals for ways to do crypto based on storing a key in the CPU registers, which um, ends up being incredibly ugly for a variety of systems reasons, but, uh, but might be effective if you're willing to go down that, that tortuous path. Um, so. I don't believe that very much of this at all has made it into practice. And in fact, every year I have, um, in my, my graduate uh, security course, I assign a pair of students. I, I assign attacks to, to every student in the class. And a pair of students every year demonstrate the cold boot attack, starting from scratch with a contemporary machine. And so by now I've had several cohorts of students go through this, and the current software it was just as easy to, uh, to apply this to as, uh, as things years ago. This is by accident. You have mentioned the one set among the, the products? That I haven't mentioned what? What's point that? Point point it's, it's also oh, point sec. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if we looked at it. Was that around in 2008? Maybe it was, and we just didn't, didn't look at it. I, it's, it's, it's um, I, 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 I would be surprised if it's if it's any, any different fundamentally. Yeah? You also looked at uh, storing the password in in the, the key in different types of RAM, like SRAM? Um, so SRAM has been studied by others quite extensively. Um, and uh, uh, SRAM remnants had been, uh, 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 had been discovered um, years before. And you really would expect SRAM to have to have remnants, right? Because you don't need to refresh it. It's a, every, um, every bit is stored in some, I don't know, some hyperstable group of transistors or something, whatever you call it. Um, uh, 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 so SRAM, I would not expect to, to be uh, any better in this way. It might be, um, it might be worse, in fact. Um, uh, there is this, there, there are other places you would think, so what, what does the CPU have access to, right? It could try to, to leave it somewhere in registers, to try to make sure it never gets out of cache. Um, those seem like the two primary things that you can do uh, to make sure the key is going to be very, very close to the core in the CPU. Um, architecturally, those are, um, uh, actually have gotten somewhat easier. I don't think anyone's doing them. Um, but uh, the, the register scheme has been proposed. And as I say, it's kind of inelegant, but, but might work. All right. Um, this is, uh, I love talking about, about cold boot, but I'd like to tell you very briefly about another application uh, in this uh, kind of assumptions related to crypto category. And this is going to be a very different problem domain. This is going to be censorship resistance. Um, and this is joint work with my students, Eric Wustrow and Scott Walchok, and with Ian Goldberg at Waterloo. So OK, um, we have a sort of another information problem here. We, starting from the sort of maybe the, we were talking before about the problem of protecting the confidentiality of your data. Let's move to the problem of accessing information uh, over a network um, when someone who has very great control over the network is trying to stop you. Um, so you can think about this as another problem in this broad spectrum of privacy and confidentiality. Um, internet censorship is practiced 
In many parts of the world, of course, um, this is not simply a China thing, although China is one of the leading suspects, the, the, the leading practitioners of internet censorship around, along with Iran, other countries in the Middle East, Russia, and so forth. Um, there are a variety of techniques that these countries use to censor the internet. Um, we're going to focus on, um, uh, for, for, for this part of the tutorial, on network-based techniques um, that operate on, at the at the protocol at the internet, uh, the TCP/IP level for the most part. So these are going to be things such as um, uh, examining network traffic for particular keywords and blocking those connections, blocking the IP addresses of sites you don't like by at the routing level, black holing them, um, blocking the DNS entries for Google or Facebook by uh, returning fake results. These are things you can do at the network protocol level to, to implement a censorship policy. Um, of course, citizens in censored countries who are tech savvy are going to respond by employing techniques like Tor, um, uh, using anti-censorship systems, maybe using VPNs. Um, uh, there are a variety of countermeasures that users take. Of course, the censors don't stand still. They apply counter-countermeasures, uh, things like blocking VPNs, like uh, uh, a series of increasingly advanced countermeasures for Tor that we'll, I'll talk about uh, a little bit if we have time. There's a cat and mouse game going on here, and a, a very fast-moving and exciting one between countries that are censoring the internet and users and researchers who are uh, attempting to get around that censorship. Now, Tor, of course, mo most of you probably know about Tor. Tor is an anonymous communication system that came out of, uh, out of academic research that's now very widely used uh, as, a, as a production service um, by users who want to, um, say, access information on the internet without revealing their identities. And Tor works essentially by tunneling your network traffic through um, a random selection of uh, of what are called relay nodes, which are um, uh, essentially computers running at the edge of the network in different jurisdictions around the world, which accept encrypted connections and forward them out in another direction uh, in, a, in a freshly encrypted envelope. So Tor, at a, at a high level, works like that. But Tor has also increasingly been used for censorship resistance. And um, so countries like China and Iran have taken special steps to try to block the Tor network. Um, the simplest thing they can do is just figure out where computers um, that are entry points to the Tor network are and add those to their list of banned sites. In response to that, the Tor project introduced a technique known as Tor Bridges. Um, the idea here is that you're going to have a set of um, entry points of uh, uh, of uh, proxies into the Tor network, um, but you're not going to just advertise them to the whole world. You're going to only tell a few users about each of them. And uh, in order for a user to find out where some of these are, they're going to have to go to a special web page or email a particular address, and you're going to rate limit how many of the entry points they can find out through that technique. Um, this was somewhat effective for a while, but you've got to remember that the people they're up against are nation state level adversaries who can throw a lot of resources at this. Um, they can throw a lot of IP addresses at trying to get information about this. They can have a lot of people working on this and requesting different sets of, uh, of bridge nodes. Um, they can apply more advanced techniques to try to probe to see whether a computer is a bridge. And in fact, this is one thing that China is doing. If you connect to an HTTPS site from China, China will follow up a few minutes later with a probe to see whether that site was actually supporting, uh, actually providing Tor bridge services. They'll try to connect to it as a Tor client uh, if they haven't seen that IP address before. Um, so amazing level of sophistication here. The cat and mouse game is pretty bad. But the fundamental problem that we get to is this need to communicate um, information to people in the censored country. Maybe the information is the IP addresses of proxy servers or some credentials for, for accessing, to that, uh, accessing them. We need to be able to communicate this information to those users 
without the sensor in those countries figuring that out. And we probably don't know in advance which of those users are or may become informants and be working in confederation with the sensor. So this is a, a, a pretty tough problem to get around. At least we assume that's the problem, right? What if we could have a censorship resistant system and a kind of next generation approach to this that uh, uh, removes that requirement where we could tell everyone in the censored country the same information in advance and still make it very, very difficult for the censor um, to figure out who's using anti-censorship services or to block them. This is the idea that underlies the anti-censorship system I've been developing for the past couple of years, which is uh, something that we call Telex. Telex um, is based on the idea that instead of putting censorship resistance technology at the edge of the network, say a bunch of Tor nodes in various people's labs or offices or basements, um, we're going to try to put it into the core of the network by working with ISPs, especially the large ISPs that are transiting huge volumes of the world's traffic. Let's suppose we could get those ISPs to install some kind of technology to support internet freedom. Um, if we can do that, we can apply this technique that we've developed, which we call end-to-middle proxying, um, which allows users who can, tran who can cause data to flow through any of these ISPs that are running the technology to receive anti-censorship service. Um, so we're not like Tor. We're not trying to provide anonymity. Just uh, that'll be important later. Um, if you care about deep packet inspection and the politics of that, this ends up being pretty cool because we're repurposing all of that technology, not for violating people's um, privacy or censoring them, but for providing a robust anti-censorship service. <coughs> all right, so let me explain how this works. So first, just to imagine where this might be. Um, here's a picture of undersea cables flowing out of you know, this region of the world here. This is uh, China and Japan and so forth. There are just a small number of choke points here is the important thing to, to note, where a huge volume of traffic is flowing. Let's imagine that we can get some subset of these choke points, um, some large subset of them maybe eventually, um, to be participating in internet freedom initiatives. All right. Um, uh, with that background, let me tell you how the system works first at a high level. So here's our model. So this is the cartoon version of the system. Here's our model of the sensor. The sensor is, um, uh, owns a part of the network that is their jurisdiction, say China. Um, and within that network, they have extremely strong control over what's going on. They can inspect all the traffic. They can, uh, uh, they can uh, 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 apply arbitrary um, packet blocking. But their objective is to implement a blacklist policy. Rather than a whitelist policy where they only allow certain things through, they have a list of stuff they want to stop. Um, one thing that they don't block absolutely, we posit, this is in our model, is say HTTPS, some kind of authenticated encrypted channel. Um, because interfering with HTTPS outright would basically make e-commerce impossible, would prevent um, uh, users from using virtually any modern website that requires authentication for any important purpose. Uh, we're just positing that that would be economically infeasible. We also posit that they're not going to unplug the network entirely. Um, some countries have done that, um, but uh, in uh, uh, the majority of those cases, the government has fallen within a very short period of time. So uh, that's sort of a last ditch uh, effort for the censor. All right, so here's um, how the system is going to work. We have a client here in the censored country that's running some software that we've provided. Um, this is public open source software anyone can see. So we require them to be able to get an intact copy of the software. Um, in the middle of the network, at big choke points, major ISPs, um, they're going to be routers where we've installed special software, I'll mention in a second. And at the end, just to understand the diagram, we're going to have a site that is by policy allowed by the sensor and one that's by policy prohibited. 
So these could be, I don't know, the Chairman Mao fan club and, uh, uh, and, any, and uh, 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 Wikipedia. All right, so the user wants to initiate a request. Um, whoops, what happened with my slide? Uh, the user wants to initiate a request to a blocked site. It's going to be blocked by the sensor somewhere in the network. So instead, they use our software, um, which we're going to install on the client, uh, as a local proxy. And that software is going to make a connection on behalf of the user, not to the prohibited site, but to some permitted site um, that happens to have telex infrastructure on path at an ISP. Um, it's going to add to that connection a steganographic tag. And this is where it gets interesting to the cryptographers, but I'll explain how this works in a minute. For the non-cryptographers, all I mean is some information that the sensor cannot see, but that we're going to be able to recognize using um, a special piece of information, uh, a private key that the, tel uh, that the telex infrastructure has. So at some ISP on path, um, uh, a telex device, this is, the, 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 uh, uh, this is a, a piece of the anti-censorship system running in the network infrastructure, has a private key that it can use to recognize these tags and uh, actually to strip off the layer of encryption. This is an HTTPS encrypted connection. Strip off the layer of encryption and provide proxy service, then taking the connection and redirecting it to a block site. I know I'm, I'm, I'm trying to rush through this and muddling it a little bit, but I hope this is clear. All right, so that's the basic idea, is that we are um, uh, disguising a connection to a non-blocked site, to a prohibited site, an encrypted HTTPS network connection to it. Um, we're, we're using that connection as a disguise to tunnel a connection to a blocked site. Um, and the way we're doing it is by marking this connection with an invisible tag that stuff we put into the network infrastructure can recognize and use to strip off the HTTPS layer and uh, recognize what the user really wants and simulate a response from the, uh, the nominal site, the non-block site, which is from the sensor's perspective where it looks like the user is connecting. Okay, but what does this mean in our, uh, the context of what I was saying before about the user, um, the, uh, this, this game between the sensor and the user where we want to be able to communicate, to, to provide anti-censorship services without communicating secrets to the user. Well, the user can tag this uh, connection using a public key that everyone is allowed to know. The location of these things in the network um, can potentially be ubiquitous. It can be, uh, we can put these on every link between Asia and North America if we had participation from ISPs. If that's the case, then any traffic that was flowing into North America on its way to any destination website could potentially be accessing um, a censorship circumvention system. We don't have to communicate addresses to users because we're converting large parts of the internet into um, places where any address can suddenly be providing anti-censorship service. That's the big idea here. Yes? What is, what is the information flow in the other direction? So the information flow in the other direction is that this device in the middle of the network is going to spoof data coming back from this site to the user. It's going to basically, um, uh, let, what's that? How does the sensor that sits, you know, the ISP interception, the user computer, you want to see the data that came, that it comes there? Because it's coming, back, it's coming back as if it's part of an HTTPS connection. So it's supposed to be encrypted from the sensor's point of view. But it looks like it's coming from the non-prohibited server. So the block.com also needs a telex client? The block.com is oblivious to all of this. The block.com is just providing HTTP service. It's receiving a connection, uh, an HTTP or HTTPS connection from a proxy that's run by the telex system. Question? Does the telex station have to take into account differences in latencies? Yes, so there are a bunch of things that, um, that we um, 
would want to get just right in order to provide a perfect disguise. Things like latency, things like uh, a time to live, things like uh, identifying features of the, the particular server that's, that's, that's running. Um, and uh, there are a long list of these that you'd have to get right to have a perfect disguise. <laughs> to have a good enough disguise for what sensors are doing now, you basically don't have to do any of them. Um, and they all cause some kind of performance penalty. Um, but you could add them as sensors get better. You could add these incrementally, whichever ones you need in response. It converts it into a cat and mouse game that I, I think is easier to win, which is one of forcing the sensor to make probabilistic decisions about, uh, 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 based on fuzzy identification um, uh, that has a significant false positive rate, rather than one in which um, uh, uh, the sensor knows absolutely that something is part of a, a circumvention system. Yes? What is that SSL scoring? Let me show you a little bit more about what, how this works. Um, <clears throat> um, so, okay, just a really basic uh, outline of the HTTPS protocol for those who don't see it and want to follow, don't know it and want to follow along. You have about 10 seconds to learn how this works. Uh, uh, you get an initial message from the client to, to the server that has uh, a nonce and some uh, protocol negotiation information. The server responds by sending a certificate. Um, uh, and its own nonce, uh, the client then, in the simplest mode, uh, just picks a key, uh, uh, encrypts it to the server with, uh, uh, with RSA and sends it over. And then they, uh, uh, they, do, they, they basically exchange um, uh, uh, hashes on the, um, uh, on the previous messages in order to, to authenticate it. <clears throat> OK. so. Um, in Telex, we make some small changes to the way a normal HTTPS handshake works in order to um, uh, allow the station in the middle of the network to recognize and strip off uh, the HTTPS. Um, so what we do, the, the major thing that we do, and this is where the steganography comes in, is we replace um, what is supposed to be a randomly generated nonce in the first message that the user sends over. Supposed to, be a, um, uh, uh, supposed to be a big random number. We're going to replace it with an encryption uh, uh, of something that we've generated using a public key scheme um, uh, that we've generated so that the distribution under cryptographic assumptions is indistinguishable from random. So this is one of the few places where you can get steganography right, potentially, um, because you know exactly what the distribution of the thing you're replacing is supposed to be. Um, with the private key at the telex station, we can recognize that it's different from random, that this is actually a specially constructed tag. Um, but the sensor can't tell the difference. Um, then, during a later step of the negotiation, we're going to do something that allows the station to strip off SSL, um, strip off the, the encrypted layer, um, which is that basically we're going to use this tag also to, um, uh, to store, uh, to, to generate the coins that we're using for our other uh, random decisions in the client for our own key generation purposes. Um, uh, and then the station can just reproduce that and generate the same, pick the same random bits and simulate the client in order to uh, arrive at the same session key that the client did. So this both lets the station recognize that this is a user requesting uh, censorship resistance service and lets the station strip off the encrypted layer and simulate uh, uh, the other party in the TLS connection. Okay, so that's the high level view. Um, uh, uh, we do a couple of other things just to make sure that it's right at the end. In order to do this, yes? Well, who owns those ISPs? I mean, how do you make sure that China doesn't own them? So, ISP and be able to do that themselves? So it's, it's a very good question. Who, who owns it and uh, how is the key going to be, to be stored? Um, the vision that I have is that the keys, these devices are um, going to be placed at ISPs, but are going to be owned by um, uh, owned by another party. That's uh, say the 
uh, the, the Telex Foundation, whatever is really providing the service, and that converts it into a problem of physical security and monitoring of the servers um, rather than one of uh, you know, trusting the entity that's running the ISP. So you can say verify before deploying Telex at an ISP that they're say not owned by China or Iran. Um, uh, uh, but um, uh, that's part of the sort of messy real world part of this is that kind of vetting and trust relationship there. Notice that the ISP gets to see who's getting what content. It's not an anonymity system in that sense. So there's some amount of trust that the user is placing in whichever um, uh, telex deployment they are using. So basically by choice of public key, they could be picking my telex deployment or say maybe, uh, 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 maybe Germany has its own um, uh, and so forth. You could add it before the ISP, right? So this, you could put the telex in front mm -hmm. of the ISP with the tool IP and say you don't have to trust the ISP. So you could put it at the ends of the network, at the edge of the network, but then it... At the, before the ISP gets it. You mean like on the backbone link, on the fiber? Sure, you could, if you, but then you're, you're at whatever carrier owns that. I don't think it converts it into a different problem. It just changes the, the name of the company. Okay, um, we started a little bit late, but I'll still try to wrap this up pretty quickly. Basically, we're implementing this with public key steganography. If you're a cryptographer, uh, uh, based on elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, if you're a cryptographer and care about those details, see the paper. All right, so I'll just skip over the rest of that and just tell you a little bit about our experiences trying to build this. Um, so we made a prototype implementation. It's a... Uh, 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 and I'll skip over the exact technologies we use, but we found we can do it uh, 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 pretty efficiently in software. We think it's going to scale, but need to do more experiments for that. Um, we have a client. So what, we have, what, what we've built, we've built, um, and you can try out today, um, we have a deployment that exists at a very, very small scale ISP, which is um, uh, basically the rack in my lab. Um, there are about a dozen websites behind it, including the Telex website and my homepage. Um, we have a client. It's an open source client, uh, runs on Windows or, Lin or Linux, um, and uh, it acts as a local proxy server. All right, so behind the lab scale ISP, ISP we have, um, say, a uh, demonstration not blocked website and a demonstration blocked website, which if you're not accessing it through Telex, the packets will just get thrown away. It's simulating IP level blocking. Um, a real deployment would be much larger, of course. Um, our not blocked website or nominal not blocked.telex.cc site looks like this. They're cute kittens. Who would want to block the cute kittens? Um, so we released this uh, when we, we came out with a paper with a, a big disclaimer that said, not, do, do not use in the real world if you're going to suffer any consequences. We can't make any guarantees. We're not ready for that. Um, uh, still, in the first weeks, in the first months, we had um, uh, uh, many, many users, especially from China, start uh, trying to use this. We've had now, uh, I think, a couple of hundred thousand people um, uh, who've been uh, Telex users at one time or another. Um, here's some early graphs from traffic on our test bed network. Um, you can see a diurnal pattern uh, centered around when the internet is being used in Beijing. Um, here's a number of simultaneous users. Um, and then this happened. One day, the traffic dropped off quite, uh, quite dramatically. Um, why do you think that is? Well, the cute kittens were blocked by China. <laughs> but then something really interesting happened. We didn't tell people this, but users in China started to figure out what some other websites at the same ISP were. In fact, a lot of them noticed that my homepage also worked and started telling each other and traffic came back up. And this is another oblivious website with nothing, it's, it's merely behind the same ISP. A few weeks later, China also blocked my homepage. 
This is why we need a much larger deployment to make this happen. Something where to block everything behind one of these telex stations, you have to essentially cut yourself off from the useful part of the internet. If that were the case, then it would be a much larger economic negative for a country to, to, uh, uh, to block the whole system. They would essentially have to um, pay huge socioeconomic costs in terms of lost ability to do commerce, lost social benefits of network connectivity, it would undermine the legitimacy, we think, um, of their censorship claims. Um, so that's the hope that someday um, uh, we're going to be able to roll this out at many large ISPs and flip the switch so that blocking them all is going to be highly undesirable for all but the most hardline censoring countries. Um, we've been doing a lot of work since then trying to figure out how to do this on fast networks, how to make this work um, uh, in uh, real DPI equipment so we can scale it to 10 gigabit, 40 gigabit network links, looking at things like open flow to do the switching really fast, um, looking at ways to make uh, uh, the problems you were talking about, the server um, uh, impersonation more accurate. And we're hoping within the next year to start a trial at a real mid-size ISP, um, at least on a, uh, not necessarily to provide service to real users just yet, but at least to make sure it's going to work um, uh, so that we can be ready to roll these out at more real ISPs if this ends up being, um, being necessary and uh, a useful way to serve um, uh, internet freedom and policy objectives. So that's the telex idea. And another way that um, uh, under, undermining assumptions, assumptions about what's necessary for uh, censorship resistance, assumptions about that the censor might be making about what uh, the, the way um, an encrypted transport works and what it means when a user is connecting to, uh, uh, say, a server that they've authenticated by a public key, is this really going to be data coming back from that server or not? That undermining these assumptions can lead to, in this case, interesting positive possibilities instead of interesting new attacks. Anyway, that's part one of the tutorial. Thank you very much.